everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is definitely a wild one. It's definitely one of the most wild cases that I've ever looked into and you will understand why in just a bit, but I do want to warn you that it does get pretty bad. You are going to get very frustrated and you will honestly want to throw up because I felt sick the entire time that I was researching. So I just wanted to put out a warning to you. If you're sensitive to more, I guess, graphic cases, then you might not want to watch this one. There's not a lot of violent details per se, but there's just a lot of information in this case that is just not pleasant to listen to whatsoever. Also, this is a very recent case, so there are still bits of information that are missing, but we do pretty much have everything that we need to know. I also want to try something new where I cut out some words, um, some of the more graphic words. I've seen some other YouTubers do it where they just kind of cut as soon as they say, you know, a certain word, but then you can still understand what I am saying. Um, that way I won't get filtered through and automatically demonetized. I don't know if that will work, but I just wanted to try it for at least one video. So if there are random little times where the sound cuts out for just a second, that's why, and I just wanted to let you know. But with all of that being said, let's just get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Stephanie Pars. Stephanie Pars was only 25 years old when her life was selfishly ripped away from her. She was the oldest of four sisters and grew up with them and her parents, Charlene and Ed Pars, in Freehold Township, New Jersey. She was a part of a very close-knit family and even had grown up in the same house that her own mother was raised in. She and her family were pretty much always together, and even when she was in her 20s, she loved hanging out with her parents and her sisters. When Stephanie was in high school, she played as catcher on her school softball team. After graduating, she went to school for cosmetology and art. Eventually, after finishing up her schooling, she got a job as a waxing specialist at European Wax Center in Freehold Township and as a makeup artist at LA Artistry in Jackson, New Jersey. Now, Stephanie was small, but feisty. She was only 4 feet 11 inches tall, but that did not stop her from having an attitude. Stephanie was described as being tough, strong-willed, hard-headed, and stubborn, yet funny, sweet, and welcoming. She was a natural leader who was tough, but she had an ability to just make everyone feel like they belong, no matter who they were. She was so inspirational and always did her best to try and acknowledge everyone's accomplishments and make them feel good and special. She loved children and animals and cared for them so much. She loved art and makeup and was just so creative and talented at what she did. Now on Wednesday, October 30th, 2019, Stephanie and her family went to a psychic medium in New Brunswick for a girls' night out. They got home to where her parents lived at around 10 p.m. Then Stephanie left by herself to go to her grandmother's house on Meadowbrook Lane, which was about a 10-minute drive away from her parents' house and where she had been living since her grandmother passed away the previous year. Her mother told her to call and text her when she got home safe, and as she was driving home, she sent a Snapchat to her family, which was of her driving home. But as abruptly as as this is, this was the very last time that her family would see her alive ever again. Now, when I say that Stephanie and her family were extremely close, I am not exaggerating. Her and her parents would be in constant communication every single day, texting back and forth throughout the day. So when Stephanie never texted her mother that night that she had made it home safely and still hadn't responded to her mother's text messages by October 31st, the next day, Charlene immediately began to worry. She started frantically calling her and texting her all day that day, but they were all going unanswered. Charlene stopped by Stephanie's house twice that day to go in and check on her, but both times she saw Stephanie's white Hyundai Sonata sitting in her driveway. This was very strange to her mother because the first time that she drove by, it was about 4 p.m., but Stephanie was supposed to be at a babysitting job from 9 to 6, and she clearly wasn't there because her car was sitting in her driveway at home. The second time that she went by the house at around 8 p.m., she decided to actually go inside to see what was going on. This is when she found Stephanie's phone sitting on the side of the couch 
which was already alarming because just like most of us, she didn't go anywhere without her phone. Her mother had also noticed that she had gotten a text from her babysitting job asking her if she was okay because she hadn't shown up. This pretty much confirmed that she missed her job and didn't even call into work to let them know that she would be missing. Now, real quick, I do want to mention that a few months before all of this happened, Stephanie was actually hospitalized from pneumonia, apparently from vaping. So because she had gotten so sick, she was out of work for cosmetology for a while and was doing a nannying job taking care of a little eight-month-old baby girl. So this definitely is not something that she would have missed. Not only was it her primary method of income at the time, but like I said earlier, she actually cared about this little girl. She loved children and she loved taking care of them. Plus, she had just started this job two weeks prior, so she would be getting her first paycheck that very same day. So she definitely would not have no call, no showed and missed her first paycheck when she was already low on money and hadn't been making money for quite some time. So anyways, Charlene did try to get into Stephanie's phone, but she wasn't able to. She wanted to see if there was anything strange in her phone, but she didn't have the password. So she just started reaching out to all of Stephanie's friends to see if anyone had seen her, and no one had, except for one person. One of Stephanie's sisters had actually reached out to Stephanie's on-again, off-again ex-boyfriend at the time, John Osbligen, to see if he had seen her. And he did. He said that he went to Stephanie's house the night that she went missing at around 10 p.m. and then he spent the night there. And then he said when he got up the next morning to leave for work, he said that she was still there. But after that, he said that he hadn't seen or heard from her all day and he too was very worried about her. But the thing about John was that he actually had a very extensive history of domestic abuse. One of his past girlfriends had a restraining order out against him and he had been charged twice with domestic violence and Stephanie herself had reported him for domestic abuse that previous September saying that she had tried to break up with him but he hit her in the head and she was scared that he was going to hurt her again. And at the time of Stephanie's disappearance, he was in the middle of another court battle with yet another accuser. Also with his story, it seemed a little bit strange because Stephanie's mom found her phone on the side of the couch. It was actually between the couch and the wall in the crevice. She always had her phone with her and probably used it as an alarm, so she probably would have taken it to bed with her that night, so why would she have left her phone in the living room? This is also something that Charlene noticed when she went through the house. So that very same day, Charlene called 911 to report Stephanie missing. Now, I find this 911 call very interesting, and you will too when you listen, because she sounds like such a smart woman and does not hold back when telling 911 exactly what she thinks and everything that she knows. 911, where's your emergency? County, this is Hal with the 911 transfer. I have Charlene on the line. She is in Freehold at number 14, Route 33. She'd like to report her 25-year-old daughter as missing. Okay, Charlene, you there? Yes. All righty. So um, when, did, uh, when did your daughter go missing? Um, she left me at 10 o'clock last night. Going to back to my mom's house where, where she's staying. Um, and I told her to text me or call me when she got home and nothing. And I've been calling and texting her all day. I went over there at four o'clock and her car was there. Um, but she was supposed to be at work from nine to six. Went back there again, like around eight, nine o'clock. And I found her phone, um, which she never goes anywhere without her phone. And um, I can't get into her phone. I can't remember her password, but I was able to see one of her notifications and her job texts her saying, you didn't show up to work today, is everything okay? Um, and we still haven't heard from her, she's still not home. Okay, what's her name? Stephanie. And last name? Cars, P as in Peter, A-R-Z-E. I've reached out to almost every, every friend that she has and everything, I can't, there's... Okay, do you know um, what kind of car Stephanie has? She has a white Hyundai Sonata, it's still in the, in the driveway. So she didn't leave in, in her car? No. 
No, and apparently, like, her so-called ex-boyfriend um, was, we, there's a domestic violence thing going on in court, um, and my one daughter reached out to him to see whether or not he had seen her, and he said that he saw her last night, he stayed there, and she was getting for work, ready for work this morning, um, and has not heard from her since all day. Okay. Um, Charlene, but like I said, what's, there's a domestic what's a good phone number for thing you? with him. And her phone was left at her house or with you? I No, I left it at her house in case um, she came home. I, I put it on the charger because um, I noticed all day today, like it, when I checked it, because I did like find your device and her location was off. Um, so then when I went back to the house again uh, this evening, I did the find your device again, but then I tried to play sound and it rang and I found it on the side of the couch. Okay. What is her ex-boyfriend's name? So there's a history of domestics. John Osbligen. Do you know how to spell his last name or? Yeah. O-Z-D-I-L-G-E-N. All right, ma'am. Um, can I have a physical description of, of uh, Stephanie? She's four foot 11. Um, she's probably like 115 pounds, brunette, like dark you know, brown hair. Um, I would say mid it's like, you know, below her shoulder, past the shoulder, brown eyes. Um, she wears glasses a lot. And she um, she wasn't saying anything about, you know, going somewhere, you know, over the weekend, like maybe going out for a Halloween no. thing? No. And she had, like, my daughter has no money right now. And she um, had started a job two weeks ago. And... They were told her that they were going to, you know, pay her at the end of the month. So she would have actually gotten her first paycheck either today or tomorrow. You know, wouldn't miss work, you know. She, she's a nanny. She's taking care of a little girl. And she's not a morning person, you know. So I was thinking, oh, maybe she overslept, you know. But she wasn't there when I was there twice, you know. And then I just had a friend go over there again. She's still not there. Um, he even checked the backyard and the pool and they're every, everywhere, and, and she's still not there. And I've reached out to friends, and no one has heard from her. Okay. All right, ma'am. We're going to have an officer come out there and talk to you. Um, he's going to take a formal report, um, and we'll see if we can contact her. Don was the last person to see her, though, correct? John. 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 Okay. I called, I called Verizon to see if there was any way I could get onto her phone. Because I think I know two, I think I know four of the numbers. I can't. She told me what the password was at one time, and I can't remember what it was. Okay. But I couldn't get on. I called Verizon. Um, they said the only thing you could do is do a factory restart, but that would delete a whole thing. But the funny thing is, like, if this guy John slept over last night and like she was getting ready for work, like, why would her phone be on the side of the couch? Right. Um, okay. Instead of, like, in the bedroom where she gets ready. She would only be sitting there if she was, like, sitting watching TV. Right. You know what I mean? So, I don't, you know, whether he's just saying, like, he really slept over and has, you know, saw her this morning. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. I, I understand that you're that you're upset right now. Um, I would be, too. I have an officer that's going to come over, and they're going to talk to you. Okay. Um, so... He, he's going to be on his way in a, in a few, okay? So I have four girls. You know, she's my oldest. And I even had, like, other people try and text her and stuff, but obviously she didn't have her phone. She doesn't take her phone. She takes her phone everywhere, everywhere, you know, so. Right. And her car is there. So she, you know, so, but, all right, I, I'm I'm going to go lock the doors upstairs so that they don't bark. So okay. My daughter. All, all right, right thank you. No problem, Charlene. All right. So, because of the fact that Stephanie had gone missing so abruptly and was involved with this man who had such an extensive history of domestic violence, investigators immediately set out to search for Stephanie and name John as a person of interest pretty quickly to get all of the warrants they would need as fast as possible. Now, John Osbligen was a 29-year-old stockbroker who worked at a Staten Island brokerage firm, but was fired and was out of work at the time of Stephanie's disappearance. Due to all of the suspicious circumstances and because of the fact that he was the last person who claimed to see her alive, police were able to pretty quickly get a search warrant to dig through his phone. It didn't take long before police discovered that John had sent 10 very angry texts and Facebook messages over a span of nine minutes to Stephanie the night that she went missing while she was just out trying to enjoy herself with her family. I couldn't find exactly what all of these text messages said, but 
As you can imagine, these text messages were very nasty. He called her some very horrible names and basically said, like, you were just making this entire relationship suck. Why do you have to make everything suck all the time? Which with that, I want to mention that he still had himself and Stephanie listed as a relationship on Facebook, but Stephanie listed herself single on her Facebook. I also saw that when questioning John, detectives noticed that he had marks on his neck. So obviously that stood out as very strange to them. So the next thing that they discovered on John's phone is absolutely horrific. And I know a lot of you will be very upset when you hear it. So I just want to warn you now that even just reading this made me absolutely sick to my stomach. So while searching John's Google search history, detectives found two searches on his phone related to child porn. They found images like this on his phone with nine images showing children as young as three years old being sexually abused in his phone. I'm sorry, but that just makes me so freaking upset. And I literally just want to throw up just saying it. And I can't even imagine how freaking disgusting you have to be to want to have that on your phone. Sorry, I just, I can't even imagine because it's just so freaking horrible. But because of this, on November 8th, he was arrested in his home and charged with having these images. He spent some time in jail before he was released on bond on November 19th. He spent some time in jail before being released on bond on November 19th. Now, I want to mention that John's lawyer was actually upset that he was held for a total of 11 days in jail because apparently it isn't considered to be a danger to society. And since he wasn't arrested in relations to Stephanie's actual disappearance, that this should not be considered when holding him in jail for these other charges. It's just crazy to me that a man who is found to have these disgusting images on his phone with a history of several domestic abuse allegations and is a suspect in a missing persons investigation somehow is not a danger to anyone. But thank goodness that the judge decided to monitor John and told him, don't use the internet while you're out, don't do drugs while you're out, and make sure to look for a job. Obviously, this is atrocious, but it gets even worse as we go on with this case. So he was facing up to five years in jail for this, which is definitely not enough time, but police returned to his home about nine more times to continue searching. They took two electronic devices and were seen carrying out several more bags of items from his home. Now, I don't know exactly what other items he took or what they found on these two electronic devices, but honestly, I don't even wanna know because it was probably horrible. So police also went to Facebook to investigate some of the disturbing things that were posted from John's account or an account thought to be John. The name on the Facebook was John Oz, but on the Facebook, it had a profile picture of John Osbligen. So on July 5th, John Oz had posted a meme to a group called My Couch Pulls Out But I Don't that said, when she says, choke me daddy and you get carried away and now she's dead. And then it had a picture of Arthur with a shovel. Sorry, this screenshot is so blurry. It is the best one that I could find. Another post from him to this Facebook group was a screenshot of text messages with the caption, how selfish is this girl? Again, I'm so sorry for how blurry these photos are, but the messages read as follows. Person one, I don't want to do anything. If you come, I want to watch TV and go to sleep. I'm exhausted. Last night, you wore me out too much. Person two, that sounds horrible. Person one, what do you mean? Sounds normal to me. Two, you know I hate that. I don't care. I hate that you want it every day. You don't give me a break. We don't have to have sex. No, but something has to happen to you. So, exactly. Yes, this just sounds so selfish to me that she wanted to sleep after being exhausted from a very long day. But 
Anyways, police, friends, family, and volunteers continuously searched every word that they could to try and find Stephanie. Now, if you're kind of confused with the timeline, the search of John and having all of those other charges with the investigation into the Facebook messages and all that was happening simultaneously while all these people continued searching and police continued other routes in the investigation. They scoured the densely wooded areas between Stephanie's house and Tottenville based on information that they had received early in the investigation. They had then moved on to search Long Pond Park in Richmond Valley in Staten Island with the help of the NYPD. So now the search had expanded across two states from New Jersey to New York. They decided to search a specific area because after tracking John's phone, they had found that his phone was in this wooded area at about 3 a.m and he was there for several hours on the night that Stephanie went missing. They used sniffer dogs, boats, helicopters to aid in the search, but they didn't really find anything useful, but they went back to the same place several times to search over the months that followed. The family also went around trying to see if anyone knew anything and posted missing persons flyers with their face on them absolutely everywhere. Everyone still had a tiny sliver of hope that maybe she was still out there somewhere, but this entire time, it was pretty much assumed that John did have something to do with it and they were probably looking for a body. They still hadn't found anything connected to Stephanie whatsoever, but he obviously looked so suspicious that this was the only thing that even made sense. Officials were very public with saying that he was their key suspect and John knew it himself. He knew that what he was saying and what he did looked very bad but they hadn't found quite enough evidence to move forward with any murder charges. They searched these areas several times and really did a thorough job and did not waste any resource in doing so. They just needed to find something to finally go forward with the charges to make sure that they could actually get these charges through and not have a very flimsy case. However, like I said, this case just keeps getting worse and police would never get the chance to charge John with anything. On November 22nd, less than a month after Stephanie went missing, John Osbligen's father found his 29-year-old son deceased in the garage of his parents' home after he had taken his own life by hanging. Police had actually been surveilling the home for quite a while and were stationed outside of the home already when his body was discovered, so his dad ran over to police to ask for help, but they could not revive him. And near his body, they found two notes that he had written. One was to his ex-girlfriend and the other was to his parents. So I will do my best to try and read these, but they are a little bit hard to read because the handwriting is kind of crazy. I also want to say that this one is incredibly upsetting, just like everything else in the case. The note to his ex-girlfriend reads, I love you so much, little lady. I miss you so much. I don't know what I was thinking when I effed up our relationship. You were the best thing that ever happened to me. I tried to move on many times. I will never for another lady feel the way I feel for you. Recently, I tried to reach out to you. You got a restraining order. Why? At the moment, I felt my entire world ended. I really needed you in a huge way. Look at the mess I created. Don't believe everything in the news. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're having an amazing life. You deserve it. Not a day goes by where I don't think about you and Ben. The girl in the news with me was such a piece of S. She hurt me over and over when I was already at my lowest. She was a horrible person. Please help my parents with my funeral. You're the only person that I've ever loved. Sorry for everything. I wish I could go back in time and correct my mistakes, but I can't. Frowny face. So let's quickly talk about this note. He sits there and his last ever thoughts are to gaslight his ex-girlfriend into making her feel guilty for not wanting to get back with a man who abused her physically and probably emotionally. He tried to guilt her into not being there for him when he was at his lowest, which was probably him referring to him killing his ex-girlfriend or the child, but who knows. Then he asked that she help with his funeral when she clearly wanted nothing to do with him, 
but now he's forcing her into an incredibly uncomfortable situation. Then he went on to say only horrible things about Stephanie, as if killing her wasn't enough. He had to go on to make sure this woman knew that Stephanie was a piece of shit who just hurt him. Yep. So the next note he wrote to his parents and I think his siblings, I'm not exactly sure who the other people are, I'm just assuming. Um, but again, this note will make you angry. And it really just shows how much of a coward he was. So the note to his parents reads, Sorry about all of this craziness. I've been miserable for so long now. I had enough. Thanks for everything. I can't do life in prison. Most of what you hear is true, except for the child blank. I would never do that. I used the pics with me and blank for the funeral. That was the only time in my life that I was truly happy. I want blank to help plan everything with you. Tell her I'm sorry and I love her. She was so good to me. We had an amazing life. I effed it up. She really did do good for me. I dug myself into a deep hole. This is the only choice. I love you guys. Smiley face. So with this one, he kind of admitted that he killed Stephanie. He didn't come out directly and say it, but he knew what was on the news. He also admitted that he's a coward. He then went on again to try and force his poor ex-girlfriend into helping him with the funeral. He then tried to lie about the other horrendous thing that he did, saying that he would never do that. So for some reason, he was cool with everyone knowing that he killed a woman, but not with this. Now, I will mention that when he was being charged with this, his lawyer claimed that these pictures were somehow on his phone unintentionally. That's the extent to what I've seen reported, but I don't know about you, but I've never accidentally had pictures like this on my phone. I've never randomly had really disgusting internet searches like this pop up on my phone. I don't think that pictures and internet searches like this ever just appear on someone's phone. I'm not great with technology, but I'm pretty confident that that's not how it works. He was a very sick, disgusting person, and I feel bad for his family, but I don't feel bad for him. I'm sorry if that's offensive to anyone, but I'm happy that he's not walking on this earth anymore, breathing the same air as us. Although I bet he would have a pretty horrible time in jail because even prison inmates, even the worst of the prison inmates, don't take kindly to someone who is responsible for abuse of children and people who murder women. Plus, of course, I think it's incredibly responsible for people to take responsibility for their actions, and it bugs me so freaking bad when people just squirm out of having to face anyone and facing the people that they wrong. So I guess I'm very conflicted with that, but I don't know. Now, on the morning of January 27th of this year, authorities announced that the body of Stephanie Pars had been found. She had been found in a forested area called Old Bridge, which is off of Route 9 and about 20 minutes away from her home. I guess this area had been previously searched without them finding anything, I'm not sure how, but it was two teenage boys who stumbled across her body and alerted authorities giving even more people horrendous traumatic experiences to have to deal with for the rest of their lives. So I guess these two boys were 17 and 18 years old and had been walking down Route 9 to go to work when they spotted something that appeared to be a mannequin about six feet away from the guardrail. They said that her body was face down and was really close to the road, but it was not visible to drivers, only pedestrians. So you can imagine that not many people would have seen it because not many people are probably walking down that road. But of course they were horrified when they realized that it was in fact a real human body and not just a mannequin. They called police who showed up within minutes. Her body was partially decomposed, so they needed to perform an autopsy to confirm that it was her, but of course, it was actually her. During the same press conference where they announced this on the 27th, they announced that they are pretty certain that John alone is responsible for the death 
and that no one else is thought to be involved whatsoever. It was said that they haven't determined an exact cause of death yet, but I do think that it will be very telling when we do find out this information. So using John's past history with women and those text messages that he had posted to Facebook where it's assumed that he was texting Stephanie, which we don't know for sure, but this person is saying that they don't wanna sleep with him and then how does he respond? He says that she's selfish and he can't possibly see her side. He only thinks of himself. I think that he possibly could have gone to Stephanie's place to sleep with her, but she didn't want to. I think that he may have gotten angry and then tried forcing himself on her. I think that when he did so, he was too violent and accidentally killed her, or maybe he did it on purpose, or maybe he just got angry that she wouldn't sleep with him and then just got angry and hurt her straight up. That's why I wish that we knew the autopsy results, which I know we will be getting eventually, and I hope they release them soon, and if they do, I will let you guys know as soon as I know, but Either way, whether we know exactly how it went down or not, we know his history. We know that he is a sick, disgusting person. I think he probably got angry about something that she did. I mean, we know how disgusted he was with her and how little he thought of her according to the note that he wrote. And then I think he hurt her. Whether it was out of anger or because he just wanted to, it really doesn't matter. My heart absolutely breaks for Stephanie's parents. I cannot even imagine what they've gone through. They were so close and after Stephanie's disappearance, her mother did everything right, but there was nothing more that she could have done. I have watched her dad talking about all of this and you can just feel his devastation. He lost his firstborn daughter. This man that she was seeing, who by the way, her family barely even knew, he ripped her away from her family who she was so close to and everyone else who loved her and for what reason we don't know he never had to face them he never had to stand in front of a judge and take responsibility for what he did and explain why he did it he never had to take responsibility for the things that he did to children until his last breath he sat there and bashed Stephanie and blamed her for everything. It was clear to me, at least, that he did have feelings for Stephanie, or at least something, because he wouldn't let her break up with him, and he wouldn't take it off of his Facebook that he was in a relationship with her. I mean, obviously, it does go to a point where he could have just wanted to control her, and he does seem like that type of person. But either way, he obviously didn't think so lowly of her that he didn't go out of his way and want to see her and send her multiple text messages saying, you make this relationship suck when there was no relationship. He is the one that wanted to force her to stay with him, yet he acts like she was such a terrible person who just did these awful things to him. That's why it pisses me off so bad that he doesn't have to take any responsibility. He doesn't have to sit in jail and think about how disgusting he is. Again, not only for killing this beautiful young woman who had so much potential, but for his disgusting, repulsive sexual crimes against innocent little children. He never has to take responsibility for either. He is selfish for taking his own life, and I don't care if anyone disagrees with me. I said it earlier that I'm glad that he is not a breathing, living waste of human life, and I am, but it still pisses me off that he never even had to face anyone, and he took the coward's way out. And I'm sorry again if that offends anyone, and that is not the case for every person who takes their own life, but for this case, it definitely is. He didn't take his own life because he was struggling with something internally. He did something horrible and he didn't wanna to have to take responsibility for it. He died thinking that what he did wasn't that bad and that you know this woman just wouldn't accept him when he was at his low point. He died thinking that Stephanie was in the wrong because she was mean to him, not even acknowledging that he hit multiple women and that he was a horrible person. It pisses me off that our justice system who knew that he was a woman abuser and a child predator let him out of jail and allowed all of this to happen. 
It's a colossal slap in the face to everyone, including his ex-girlfriend, Stephanie, and those children that he was let out and considered not a danger to himself and not a danger to anyone else. I just wish his ex-girlfriend got a chance to tell him, no, I will not be a part of your life because you hit me. Your actions are wrong. I wish that Stephanie's parents got the chance to tell him how much of a piece of actual human garbage that he is for what he did to their daughter. I wish that he had to hear everything that everyone had to say about him, about how much of a monster he was, so he could finally realize that no, it's not everyone else that's in the wrong. It's him. It's not these innocent women that he abused that are in the wrong for not accepting him. I wish his family had to sit there and see him getting charged with the child so they know how disgusting he is, so he had to live with the fact that his parents know how repulsive he is. But no, he took his own life. He doesn't have to watch his parents find out what he's done. He just died hoping that his parents believe him about the child porn stuff, and he died thinking that he didn't do anything wrong and that his parents still saw him a certain way. He doesn't even have to face Stephanie's family for what he did to their daughter. It just breaks my heart for Ed and Charlene, not only because of what he did, but because he will never receive the consequences that he deserves. Ed and Charlene are so very strong to this day. They are happy that they at least have her body to put her to rest. Ed called those two boys that found her bodies angels sent from heaven, and he is so grateful that they just happened to find her, which just goes to show how strong they are, how appreciative they are of everything. Ed said, quote, Stephanie is home. She's coming home at last, right where she belongs, and we have God to thank. There are just so many injustices in this case and so much heartbreak. He had been accused of assault from multiple women and he was found to be a child predator and he was a suspect in a missing persons investigation. He should have been in jail long before Stephanie even went missing for beating so many women. He also shouldn't have been let out of jail when awaiting for his trial. This should have never happened to Stephanie. Again, my heart goes out to Stephanie's family and everyone who loved her. I know that Stephanie was an amazing, creative, and kind woman who just had so much potential to do so many great things in her life. And it's just so heartbreaking that she's gone. So that is all I have for today's case. Obviously, I could rant on forever about how many things could have been done in this case that could have prevented this from even happening in the first place, but I'm sure you guys know by now, and I'm sure hopefully you agree with a lot of it. This was actually a quite difficult case to look into, and when I got the suggestion from the person who emailed this to me, she actually gave me quite a nice rundown of everything in the case, and I knew it was going to be a difficult one, but I was just not expecting it to be this bad. Thank you guys so much for listening to Stephanie's story and for sticking through with it with me, even though I know it was very hard to listen to, but that's where I'm going to leave it for now. If you liked this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to email them over to me at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!